Okay, welcome to Saturday Night Firing Lines, and very glad to be here with our extended family here at Revolution Radio. Call in immediately. Uh, that includes Brian Toby, who was on my Facebook just earlier, who was uh, speaking about a number of things that have been going on in his life with... He feels his, uh, he's got his emails being intercepted, or at least uh, what he's trying to post on Facebook. He's certainly not alone in that. That happens quite a bit. Facebook has become very uh, tyrannical, somewhat of a police state in terms of how it controls what's being posted on it. So we all have to be somewhat cautious in how we present our materials. Certainly someone like myself who publicly presents many materials, in a sense, I have the most to worry about, in a sense, I have the least to worry about, because it's one of those things where once you're publicly recognized as someone who contends with information dissemination, it becomes very difficult for them to suppress that, because obviously that's what people expect from you. And if you start pumping out information, then people become suspect. So there's a delicate balance on all sides regards the phenomena of information dissemination and information suppression. So to help us disseminate information, do call in at 1-347-688-2902. Once again, that's 347 area code 688 2902. That's within the United States. Now, worldwide, inclusive of the United States, we have an 800 number now. So do take this down. 1 855 slash 655 8453. Now, that's got the added extension of 802. So remember that extension. That extension's 802. And the 800 number itself is 855-655-8453. And uh, Freedom Screen, all lowercase, all one word, is, as ever, our Skype key. And, of course, it always helps to Skype friend my producer. A Mad Painter is his Skype ID, real name Thomas Becker. But uh, go through A Mad Painter, Skype friend him, and we can drag you in on air at a moment's notice. Also want to let everyone know that we are looking for hosts and producers. So Joshua Jenkins, uh, sir, if you're listening tonight, if you want to see if you can come on to Revolution Radio, uh, you might have to switch sides <laughs> from where you're at right now. Said radio, uh, shall we say, uh, the broadcasting source, which I shall not name, and uh, then you can join the, uh, the ever-growing and obviously... Are you there, Douglas? Okay. Can you hear me? Now we can. Uh, so long as every, anyone can hear me, the uh, point I was going to make about the wheels coming off the train, hopefully, to some extent, has to do with the Boston bombing. The suspect uh, had no gun in the boat where he was arrested. And uh, to put that into perspective, what uh, this means is that the man who owned the boat when the police captured the uh, Chechen, as he's identified, a Chechen uh, of Chechen ethnicity or ethno-nationality, uh, by the name of Jokar, and that is spelled with the D-Z-H-O-K-H-A-R, and Jokar was apparently caught wounded in a boat. Uh, he was lying there. The boat owner uh, was interviewed in which he said that uh, Jogar had no firearm and therefore could not shoot back at the police. Therefore, all the bullet holes in the boat were from the police firing on an unarmed, injured man who was not resisting. So uh, this tells you volumes about the fact that the wheels are coming off the train in the sense that the information even got out. But it gets more spectacular. The 7-Eleven corporate headquarters has stepped forward and declared that the United States government is lying, that uh, there never was a robbery of the 7-Eleven by... Jokar Sarnev, his family name being spelled T-S-A-R-N-A-E-V, 
and Jokov Slarnev was apparently, supposedly, on uh, footage, uh, security camera footage, uh, along with Tamerlan, who is obviously named after uh, Tamerlane, uh, the great Mongol who conquered Mughalia and converted to Islam. Now, in terms of the two men who were declared to be in that footage robbing a 7-Eleven store supposedly to get money to get away after planting the bombs at the Boston Marathon. The 7-Eleven has, through their communication manager, a certain Ms. Chabri, uh, Margaret Chabri, who's the director of corporate communications at 7-Eleven, has come forward and said that the management would like everyone to know that though a robbery took place at Cambridge on the night of the Boston Marathon bombing, it had nothing to do with the two individuals as identified by the police and that security camera footage would prove that irrefutably. So uh, this was published in the USA Today, which is obviously a nationwide newspaper. As a matter of fact, unless I am incorrect, essentially the only uh, nationwide newspaper in the United States. So it was uh, quite a vision that the USA Today people uh, had when they launched a nationwide newspaper. There hadn't been one since the Second World War. By the way, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Becker, what was it? Uh, just so I don't think I don't know if you can see the screen or not, but we've been joined by Michael Hemmingson. Thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. I cannot see the screen very well. I certainly do not see his icon because I think my screen has essentially frozen in place from, and now can no longer display such things. So, Mr. Hemmingson, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, what's on your mind, good sir? We've got the uh, Living Well, our uh, Well Life Expo going on in San Francisco. Uh, my manager, is Lorian Ann Fenton, is down there probably as we speak. It shouldn't be closing down till about now, actually. So people are just beginning to kind of uh, break up and go home. I myself might even be dropping down there uh, tomorrow. And um, the only reason I bring that up is I think the last time you came on, you had just been uh, doing a lot of Skype interviews with the people at Awake and Aware. And also you were um, talking about some of the things that were ongoing with plans to be at our Super Soldier Summit, which I can never cease reminding people of will be on May 17th, uh, 18th, and 19th, the weekend thereof. So everybody, see if you can prepare, purchase tickets, and if you're unable to do so, do take advantage of the live stream for a far uh, smaller price, probably around 12 to $24 that we will be charging for live stream for that convention. And then you can see people like Mr. Hemmingson, who will be interviewing the super soldiery, as well as many other speakers who and presenters who will be on site. And he's writing a book on the subject and very honored to have him with us. So, Mr. Hemmingson, what brings you here tonight? Okay, so is Mr. Hemmingson with us? If he's not, we, he can, he's always welcome to call back, and uh, we can certainly move on. Obviously, there, I would like people to know as well that we have expanded. Uh, I don't know how many people have noticed this on the Revolution Radio home site through freedomslips.com. And again, to everybody who is joining us, may I remind you to uh, allow everyone else, spread the word, allow everyone else to know about the information dissemination resource that is accessible through www.freedomslips.com, from Freedom's Lips to your ears. And obviously, we are of some importance to the establishment and the revolution in awareness because of all of the sabotage which you can see for yourself is ongoing constantly we are the most attacked and hacked site and uh server board in the nation statistically and uh i suppose that that is probably the highest compliment we can get and do want you to call in and Skype in uh, as soon as possible so that we can spread the discourse and make sure that we have a revolution radio go viral. And this would be a virus of the most feared revolution of them all, a revolution in awareness, a revolution in information. And certainly the important thing that I've just told you about those two gentlemen and the fact that we've got both individuals and corporate entities contesting the government's narrative 
is a tremendous victory in and of itself for the U.S. population. By the way, what I have uh, just opened up is a can of grape soda in case that audio picked up. It's not like I'm uh, drinking a beer grape while soda talking. Great. Use one. Grape soda. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> is this Mr. Yep. Hemmings? <laughs> yeah, I called in on the phone. I don't know what's wrong with my Skype. Okay. Uh, that's uh, Thank you. I appreciate your calling in on the phone. What brings you here tonight, good sir? Hey, um... I got a friend here. He had a question about Michael Aquino that, that you might know. He was wondering if, if it's true that in the 60s he reenacted with some CIA agents and stuff like that some ceremony in the uh, Bavarian castle where, where the, the Nazis first began. Yes, this was in the 1980s. Did you say 60s? Did he have the impression that that was in the 60s? Oh, it was in the 80s? Yes. That that was in the nineteen eighties and that was while he was on uh second mint to NATO, uh the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And what you're speaking of is the suppression ceremony that he conducted. This was often misrepresented or mispresented as a kind of communion with the Nazi Socialisten or the Nazi movement and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Satanism and national socialism are entirely different ideologies, movements, or religions, if you will. And the Luciferism that is practiced by Michael Aquino was uh, basically part of a tradition that goes back to Jack Parsons and what the Americans took from Aleister Crowley, who was holding on to the tradition of of the British Hellfire Club. So you have this Anglo-American transition of Luciferism that has essentially uh, gotten more extreme, uh, ripened on the vine, if you will, become increasingly radicalized and morbid and far more ideological as it's progressed. So what was once a very elitist occult practice for the select of the society of the upper crust or upper classes of Great Britain at the height of empire has become a mass movement in a sense. It has become instead more of a subversive insurgency, uh, if you will, into the United States military in particular, which is the most vital aspect of American economy because it is, as I've stated, ad nauseum, less than 1% of the population, but gets well over 50% statistically of our discretionary fiscal income each and every year, not to mention the black budgets that make it the 1%. It is our occupation government in a very, very real sense, though the masters they serve are economically the House of Saud, uh, as essentially they are considered infidel mercenaries, and the other master they serve through the insurgency, the subversion of men like Colonel Michael Aquino, they serve the master of Lucifer slash Satan and the fallen. Now, in terms of that working, while the Americans were conducting massive summoning rituals in tandem with genocide, the mass murder of thousands and hundreds of thousands, ultimately, of people through saturation bombing and the generation of firestorms throughout Europe and Asia. The uh, National Socialists were working on summoning rituals through their genocide in the field, through their special auction gruppen, or the Einsatzgruppen, and also through their mass murder, obviously, in the Konzenslagen, the concentration camps in Totenslagen, the death camps. Their intent being to summon the elder gods of Norsk mythology, the Azer, or the gods of Asgard, the pre-Christian gods of the Black Forest, Woden, and Thor, and uh, Freya, and what the Americans represented to them were the men who were tricked by Loki, the trickster god, into basically aligning themselves with the infernal. And so while the National Socialists in were promoting the Gnostic slash pagan conflation uh, that they had adapted, the Americans want to suppress that because through their actions, 
the National Socialist and have summoned the old pagan gods who are once again becoming much more in vogue. Europe is very secular. Europe has been left with a spiritual vacuum. Paganism is making a comeback. And the Americans, through Michael Aquino, their most powerful sorcerer, the officially recognized satanic chaplain of the U.S. Army, was sent on a mission to conduct a suppression ritual in Vevelsburg Castle. And that was the occult SS, or Schutzstaffel, uh, Security Echelon Training Academy of Black Camelot under Heinrich Himmler. And he was in the Hall of the Slain, where there is a huge icon on the floor of the Black Sun. And uh, the Schwarzenzon was a uh, summoning point that serves as a portal through which the spirit of paganism and the elder gods enters our space-time continuum. Had the National Socialist and had the time, their idea was to murder enough of the Untermenschen or subhumans in sacrifice that the elder gods would be able to break through physically and walk the earth once more. This is why the Allies were so desperate to stop them before the Allies could summon forth their elder gods, the Clefothic entities that are beneath satanic. And in this sense, the Allies have won. The elder gods are somewhat suppressed, though still trying to break through. And therefore, Colonel Michael Aquino conducted a binding and suppression ritual, which would hold them back for at least a while longer, while the Americans tried to strengthen their elder gods, their clipothic entities, as bound by the cannibalized and reverse-engineered Tesla slash Montauk technologies as applied through ordinance arrays like HARP, where they are using that as a passive binding mechanism. Now, all of this sounds absolutely wild, absolutely crazy. It doesn't right. matter, Mr. Hemmingson, whether or not you, any of the listenership, or anyone on Earth – believes any of this. All that matters is that, certainly within the United States, all of us who pay taxes pay our taxes to support men who do believe this, who live their lives by this, and who swear allegiance unto these beings. So this is their paradigm, and uh, they were at war with men who had a conflicting paradigm, and the National Socialists didn't get along no better with Satanists or the American capitalists as a rule, than they would with communists. There can be treaties drawn of non-aggression that are cynical and that are pragmatic as well as transitional, but never is there a uh, permanent acceptance of the other's ideology, and the best that can be hoped for is a cold war or a static equilibrium or a balance of power. Now, in the case of the American empire, that balance of power has, of course, gone out the window. The Americans have become the sole uh, superpower, meaning they're no longer even a superpower. They are what is termed the ultra power in a unipolar world. And it is for this reason they are so desperate to try and call on the aid of their dark gods to keep their empire at the apex for as long as possible. Uh, hopefully that puts that in some perspective. I certainly would like your feedback on it. I would understand completely if you come back with some sarcastic remarks. It would probably be the healthy thing to do. But uh, have you run into anything similar to this, or where did your friend hear about the Vevelsburg Castle ceremony? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. It's just I, it's kind of mind-boggling. I you know, think that you know this Luciferian military faction exists and operating our government. You know, and I, I believe it's true. It's just um, it just kind of blows your mind sometimes when you think about it. Yeah, most certainly, and I and that's understandable. But keep in mind that mass saturation bombing certainly was known uh, to be a failure as a strategy. The amount of bombardiers that were lost was such that it was, as I've emphasized again, to ad nauseum. Uh, the amount of bombardiers lost made it the most hazardous combat position to hold. No matter whether you were a ball turret gunner or whether you were a commanding pilot, 
or a navigator or a bombardier uh, per se. The bombardier crews uh, suffered more fatalities statistically than United States Marines did in the Pacific. It was at such a level of loss that they guaranteed if you survived what was known as a 50-mission crush, they automatically promoted you to general if you were a pilot who was the lead pilot or a command pilot of a uh, bomber. And, of course, most men never even got orders for half a hundred uh, bombing runs. Most men uh, never had half a half a hundred bombing runs throughout the Second World War because, statistically, most men never lived that long. So that was how uh, dangerous it was. Those men were sacrifices and victims of this strategy as much as anybody on the ground. And the Americans who later on formed the Strategic Air Command certainly were as criminal in their expenditure of your tax dollars as they were in terms of their bombing runs uh, against foreign populations. What did they do with your tax dollars? They took a broken, destroyed Convair B-36, uh, had been dismantled in a hur- by a hurricane, literally uh, taken apart by a hurricane. They pretty much glued it together with uh, crazy glue and paper clips. I'm being facetious, but they, they restitched it together, so to speak. Uh, even they used the term uh, staple rivets and put in a leaky nuclear reactor as well as a several hundred ton, uh, if not several thousand ton, lead wall. It sounds impossible. How could it get off the ground? But it was a multi-ton lead wall to protect the pilots, theoretically, from the leaky nuclear reactor that they were going to be comporting behind them. Now, because all of the men who flew that plane, it was automatically assumed that the radiation would go right through the lead in a large enough dose where it would sterilize them. All the pilots that flew that plane were required to be well over 60 years old. Uh, On some runs where that Convair B-36, Convair B-36H Crusader is what it was called, well, that was flying over the United States oftentimes with 80-year-old pilots. And uh, so what did it do? That nuclear reactor didn't power the plane. It was a prop-driven plane. This is the insanity. Imagine what I'm saying, a multi-engine prop-driven bomber being run on reciprocating engine uh, use of fuel was comporting around a leaky nuclear reactor. It radiated so much of the United States, literally flying low overhead. It would microwave chickens in their coops. I'm not kidding. One of the men involved with this criminal act was Stanton Friedman of the uh, United States Physicists Organization, which was taking your money and expending it on atrocities like this. He took his relatives and he moved up to Canada and has since become a citizen of Canada because he feels that the continental United States, the 48 states united on the continent of North America, are so irradiated by what he partook in that it's unlivable, literally. And that many of the physicists you'll find have done this. And why were they doing this? Uh, what was the purpose? There is no purpose. This was sheer sat- Satanism. They needed to create a cancer problem. Almost every one of us has a relative, a friend, a relation, a spouse, someone who has been impacted with cancer. Now, before the Second World War, statistically, there was no such thing as cancer. Statistically, there were very few examples of carcinoma such as squamous cell carcinoma, which was based on overexposure of Caucasians to solar radiation. So you had a common condition amongst Caucasian explorers into Africa, Caucasian sailors who were crossing the equator quite quite a bit, like my father. My father had a very aggressive case of squamous cell carcinoma. So what Americans would get, or excuse me, Europeans and European Americans, Caucasians, would get very severe cases of skin cancer. Basically, basal cell and various other um, skin cancers would manifest because of exposure to sunlight because they lack the pigmentation or the melanin to protect them from solar radiation that other ethnic groups possess. So that was what you would see in terms of cancers. Now, after the Second World War, and by this I mean uh, after ceasefire, after the war ended between Japan and America in 1952, it is still legally ongoing with the Third Reich government in exile. But all of this radiation has worldwide generated cancer rates, which beforehand did not exist. This has created a medical industry. 
This has created uh, a, a situation of genetic mutations. All of this is pure satanic. There was no rhyme or reason for this other than that these men are in service of the destruction of that which is considered divine, the very human gene pool. And uh, so this is this is what we're contending with. And, of course, uh, compared to this, the National Socialist in were most definitely eugenicists. They were most definitely trying to breed a master race as opposed to degenerating one through radiation into a literally mutated, uh, some would say some human race. So the Americans have just the antithetical ideology which they espouse and which they have been promoting uh, to realization as opposed to the National Socialist. And so you can see where the, the conflict arises. So this is definitely very much a case of your choice of elder gods. The Norse was on the, uh, was what the National Socialist in were trying to resurrect, uh, if you will, bring back into our space time continuum. And with the Americans, they have successfully brought in through a very cultic element, an insurgent subversion of the military industrial complex. They have brought in what are known in Kabbalah as clipothic entities, what, um, popular media would interpret, uh, in a Lovecraftian sense as Cthuloid uh, entities from failed universes that have never evolved even to the ability where they could sustain life, anti-life entities. So this is something that uh, is to, to differentiate this. Uh, as I've said before, the elder gods of the Norsk, the Aztecs, the Chinese, any of the classic pagan religions that have evolved organically these elder gods were gods that demanded blood and sacrifice. And in return, they provided bodily fertility and fertility of the field, of the soil. Uh, the blood that was spilled was used to enrich the life of the agrarian harvest and the cycle. This was a primal connection with the Gaian Mother Earth through representative entities that were interpreted as gods by the pre-Christian ethno-nationalities of the world. And in terms of what the Americans have summoned, all of the sacrifices that are being made through constant war and genocide that is nonstop, per Title 38 of the U.S. Code since 1990, since Operation Desert Shield, in which I participated, and the Desert Storm which followed, we have been in the illegal equivalent of war. So per Title 38 of the U.S. Code, since 1990, we have the obligation to administer veterans' benefits for injuries incurred in these armed conflicts, even though no state of war has been declared legally or popularly. We are involved in the illegal equivalent of a state of war by law, as established by Congress, if you can wrap your mind around that. <laughs> so, but why do they have that? Because we are in a constant state of conflict, and we're constantly uh, suffering and creating deaths and sacrifices. And uh, why? To feed these entities that give nothing in return. They offer no fertility. They offer nothing. They are simply weapons of literally cosmic destruction. In military parlance, entropic bombs. So that is part of the madness which we have inherited from the leaders of the World War II GI generation who took to heart the religion, if you will, of Aleister Crowley and Jack Whiteside Parsons, who, of course, is far less heard of than Aleister Crowley, but uh, should be the one that's truly famous or infamous for his accomplishments such as the Babylon working, which would be another milestone ritual similar to what you have just uh, brought forward with the Vevelsberg Castle suppression ritual. Uh, by the way, thank you so much, Mr. Hemmingson. What else would you like to share with us and your friend? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Sean. Sean. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Anything else that either one of you would like to share with us? And uh, then we'll see if anyone else can. You, you mentioned Jack Parsons. Now, didn't he, like, put aborted fetuses in his rocket that 
is indeed the case. That uh, was something that I knew of. I was uh, very impressed that you know about that. I would assume that a lot is beginning to leak out after many decades. Uh, so I'm glad to see that. Uh, that is the whole purpose of what I try to do. So yes, he did do that. It was all part of what was considered a, a, a sacrificial program. He was in charge of what was known as the agape cult. Agape, of course, means love. So they were an orgiastic, very Dionysian cult of hedonism in terms of their undercurrent of black magic and dark sexuality. And the um, oftentimes women who were involved with the cult would be impregnated. And yes, the fetuses were aborted. So they had a kind of ongoing supply, if you will, of aborted fetuses by which to do that. And these were his version of necronauts, necro meaning death. And of course, the astronaut term being taken from nautical or exploration of any field uh, or any venue. So aquanaut or an oceanaut would be a explorer of the deep or of the waters, of the oceans, of the seas. Uh, so what we have in his case was a his necronauts were the aborted fetuses that he was sending uh, supposedly to hell through his uh, through his rocket trips that would often blow in midair and sacrifice them in the name of the divinities that his followers ultimately have brought into our space-time continuum and have bound to our world. So, yes, that's very much so. Thank you very much for bringing that up. What else comes to mind before I let you go? Well, I think that's about it. Hey, at the, uh, the Super Soldier Summit, um, are we going to uh, go check out some brothels? You know, um, I'm sorry, it must be the Skype. I can barely hear you. It sounded like you said, I'll see you at the Super Soldier Summit. Are we going to check out some waffles? <laughs> waffles? Uh, no, brothel. Or should we just have them come over there? Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, first off, my uh, manager, Lorian Ann Fenton, has uh, confiscated my credit card. What a oh. bitch. And uh, but at any rate, don't tell her I said that. You kill me. At any rate, um, so I'm going to see what I can do to uh, hustle up, so to speak. Uh, I think I'll probably be journeying out of area and trying to bring some escorts back. And uh, but by the way, I do want everyone to know that Richard Allen Miller, who was formerly the uh, technical consultant for the X Files, has been undergoing a uh, number of personal issues. He may have withdrawn from the conference, but we've gone much better and we brought in Tila Tequila. And uh, Tila Tequila, uh, for those who don't know, was rated as the most popular person with something like 12 million popularity votes on MySpace. So uh, she, of course, has blazed a trail of notoriety through uh, her pornographic uh, film uh, career as well as various other appearances on Howard Stern, many other uh, venues of uh, self-promotion. Uh, she has it, and she hasn't hesitated to flaunt it and uh, have to congratulate her as a sister in the Asian Pacific Islander American community. And um, I can't remember to my embarrassment, I will have to ask her personally, whether or not she is Filipina or Vietnamese or a combination thereof. But certainly people can look up Tila Tequila to find out who she is. She has gotten very involved with the Super Soldier Summit community because she herself has suffered a stroke. She feels that she's suffered uh, from electronic harassment. She has been very afraid for her own life and the life of her family. And uh, she is. we're very lucky to have her alive uh, or even with us because of the fact that when she suffered her stroke, she literally lay on the floor for what I believe was uh, at the absolute minimum about 24 to 48 hours without any ambulances returning to her calls. So that um, began to give her the impression that someone wanted her dead. So she began to investigate that and investigate the Project Monarch uh, phenomena in Hollywood and uh, has basically come back with some impressions that she'd like to share with all of us. So let's hope that we uh, give her the opportunity. So I, I think that beats uh, Dr. Richard Allen Miller, an elderly uh, gentleman uh, talking about nanotech oils and whatnot. Uh, I think that beats that by a mile any day. So I uh, do hope to see both of you gentlemen there. Sean, you going to be joining us with Mr. Hemmingson? Oh, you can. I don't think so, but I would like to. Like that. 
Now, he sounds like he's coming through a Ouija board. I, I think that this has to do with my computer. I'm hoping everyone hears me well. So due to my insecurity in that, could you give me a one, two, three, Mr. Becker? Uh, you're doing great, and Steve Travis is joined, and I do have a couple questions from the chat room when you have a chance. Oh, please. Relay them in the text. I, can, I already I, did. See if I can, oh, I can't see them then. That's why I <laughs> mentioned it. Sadly. Sadly. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Shell, do you want to do the questions first or Mr. Travesty? Because Mr. Travesty, of course, has infinite patience because he knows the, the deal. So let's do the uh, questions first because if I get on with Mr. Tra Travesty, that could last a little while conceivably. So uh, what are the questions from the chat room, uh, Mr. Becker? Uh, Smoopy4634 asks, any news about Fukushima? Well, thank you very much for asking. Fukushima Daiichi is, of course, we have to remember a uh, – unprecedented disaster and the news is that like Chernobyl it is a disaster that will be eternal it is an eternal disaster uh, functionally and effectively uh, by the Chernobyl example, there was no containment unit. So Chernobyl would, of course, have theoretically continued to melt through uh, all the way down to the core of the earth and beyond in what was colloquially known as the China syndrome. In other words, all the way to China if uh, one were in the United States and had a nuclear meltdown. Now, uh, in terms of the Chernobyl uh, situation, now, per my understanding, per my comprehension of that situation, they had to drill tunnels underneath Chernobyl at rapid speed to beat the nuclear materials as they were melting down into the earth and pour tons of liquid concrete to concretize and harden to act as a containment unit ad hoc uh, that they created on the spot by uh, going underneath the meltdown, creating through drilling a containment unit. Uh, it, it's, what a nightmare. And then covering up the top within tons of concrete. We have a situation which was unprecedented for its time. The Soviet Union dealt with it as best as it could with international health. And ultimately, the Soviet Union collapsed almost, uh, that being one of the primary factors. And on the part of the Japanese, we have a situation where Japanese civilization will ultimately have to transform on as radical a level as the Soviet collapse. And what the Japanese will most likely do is have to initiate a very aggressive space program that uh, has to contend with colonization. They will probably be the first civilization in recorded history that has been literally forced to do that because the current situation in Northeast Asia is that as far as can be seen for the foreseeable future, Japan cannot expand into Northeast Asia on the continent of Asia. Now, that could change any day. It, Northeast Asia could dissolve into chaos uh, just as Indonesia could any, any given day. The situation is very precarious, very perilous anywhere in the world right now. Japan is one of the most stable societies on Earth, so it is one of the few societies that can take advantage of that chaos, which means that Japan may expand onto the continent of Asia, but the problem is there that the Japanese feel that they would be threatened with interbreeding, that their gene pool would dilute on the continent of Asia, which is something they would never want to see. So that is another reason why the Japanese have never been hell-bent or intentional on population colonization. Uh, they would garrison state colonize. There would be population colonization to an extent, but they were never as aggressive as, say, for instance, the mass migrations of other cultures, uh, such as the Mongols or other uh, conquest-oriented cultures, such as, of course, the Slavic Russians. Uh, and the gene pool, in every case, tends to dilute or fray at the edges of empire. The Japanese are one of the most exclusive races on Earth, and they would not want to taint that by their own reckoning. So to avoid that, the best of both, both worlds would be space colonization, where they would only be breeding with other Japanese. So in that respect, they will probably buy up the island of Nauru, N-A-U-R-U. Nauru is a kingdom which for a very short 
wild period of time was one of the wealthiest nations on earth based on guano or literally bird droppings that produced phosphates that the world was mining from the island of Nauru. And uh, Nauru went through this bizarre period where they were funding uh, movie plays, uh, acting, stage screen, theater experiments. Like Stephen King's Carrie, the novel, was turned into a musical by the king of Nauru. Uh, this, these were like financial orgasms that did his people no no good. They still have an enormous amount of money, but if they uh, don't ultimately link themselves with another economy, everyone on that island is going to have to move because it's not a food-producing island and all the phosphates have been mined out to the point where it's literally like a coral reef. It's basically a circle in the sea. And uh, they were wealthy enough to build a superhighway on it that goes in a circle so they can all drive around on cars and realize that they're trapped. And the island being right bang on the equator is ideal for the construction of a nanocarbon tubed cable vader or space elevator, which would go through miles and miles of atmospheric radiation within days, which is an enormous speed, by the way. And that could carry cargo into space quite readily without having to break the gravity well. That would infinitely help with the logistics of space colonization. Once you break out of the atmosphere, anything is comparatively easy and cheap to funnel throughout the rest of the solar system. So there is something that the Japanese will probably affiliate themselves with is the equatorial island of Nauru. And uh, that is a relationship to watch in the future. Now, uh, what was the other question, Mr. Becker? Let's see. White Falcon says, uh, uh, are you aware of the fact that Barbara Bush is supposed to be the secret daughter of Aleister Crowley? You, you know, I get that quite a bit. I, I do not know what to make of that. That may, for all I know, actually have some uh, grain of truth. That may actually be true. Uh, I have never fo followed up on that because I'm not a genealogical expert. There are people out there who dedicate their careers to tracing genealogy. And um, I've always found the Bush dynasty to be a very morbid uh, reference point. I am forced just by my environment uh, in which I had played out my career with the Department of Defense to be painfully familiar with far more of the Bush dynasty than most people are. That aspect, however, is more of like truly an in-family secret. It, it might be true. I, I certainly am not going to deny it, but I, d I don't know of any evidence that I can bring forth to back that up. But I appreciate people bringing that up. Uh, you know, you look at their faces, they do kind of look alike. I've always uh, thought that Barbara Bush looked and acted like the most angelic amongst them. Uh, if uh, she were related to Crowley, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that she has inherited genetically some stain of evil. But uh, she may, of course, uh, not be the angelic person she appears. She, she could, for all I know, be someone who is uh, much more vicious or evil or conniving. But uh, if so, let's just give her credit for putting up a good front. <laughs> so in terms of the other aspects of the Bush dynasty, I think it's far more wild, far more uh, compelling is the incontrovertible historical fact that Jeb Bush – made himself the governor of Florida by marrying a uh, Latina, converting to Catholicism, uh, conver con con convincing is the English word for it, the entire Cuban, Cubano emigre population of the peninsula of Cuba, statistically, that he was a Catholic and, a, uh, and basically that he had gone brown. Uh, so he, of course, took advantage of all of this, once he became governor, he took advantage of that position to uh, sentence Terry Schindler Schiavo to death, which gave a legal precedent for the murder and, of course, thereby the enslavement. If you can murder them, you can do anything you want with them of people who are brain dead uh, by legal definition. This doesn't even mean that they are conceptually brain dead by their own understanding. They could be entirely aware of the world around them and not able to communicate, but their inability to communicate their discomfort or their awareness renders them 
brain dead by legal definition, which means you can kill them anytime you want or you can enslave them. So that is one of the primary reasons for your federal government's research into zombism and the uh, – because if you've got ambulatory cadavers who are legally slash clinically dead, then you can do anything you want with them, including labor them into physical death were that possible. So uh, aside from that, we also have the dark one, as she's known in the Bush dynasty, who was the Latina wife of Jeb Bush, and she had several children by him. She and all those children now live in Mexico on a hacienda, getting millions of dollars a year to keep their mouths shut that, and to keep the kids away from Jeb. So we have a situation where they got what they wanted out of the brown community as they view it, out of the Latin American community by playing them like Stradivarius violin. It is very sad, very cynical. Once he was in power and go as governor, he also took advantage of his position to uh, take advantage of the hanging chads, the denial of vote counting for many Democrats, and got his brother elected. So this is a very... Um, negative situation. Nine, and nine they, one so, seven. You need to turn your radio off or mute. Oh, I'll bring him on air anyway. Is that Steve Travesty or someone else? Someone else. Oh, okay. Nine one seven. Please be patient. I'm gonna bring Steve Travesty on. Finish him up before the top of the hour. Then we'll turn to you nine one seven. And thank you very much for calling. Wish I could see you on the screen, but obviously we all seem to be having um, our problems. By the way, I want everyone. I might bring Steve Travesty on after the break because the break's going to happen any second now. Then nine one seven. So be patient. Actually, you know what? I'll bring nine one seven on first after the break because Steve Travesty knows the game. He's a fellow host on Revolution Radio. Uh, I've been on his show recently. Uh, hope he's got the audio archives for that. And I'll discuss that with him after I bring 917 on. And, uh, but in the meantime, I want to plug the fact that Revolution Radio now has a sister station known as Studio B. So uh, just to get that, uh, you know, the old, uh, shall we say, phonetic alphabet of the U.S. Army. B is in boy or, uh, well, actually, it's Bravo. But, you know, I was thinking of a sister station with uh, known as Studio B as in Boy. So there's kind of a, uh, you know, living as I do in San Francisco, there's kind of a transsexual element there that I'm all too familiar with. But at any rate, Studio Bravo, as is known in the old phonetic alphabet, is opened and we have reached a record of listeners by combining the incoming listenership stats of both stations. We have truly hit uh, the big time, and we are uh, we continue to grow, and uh, soon we will be finding new hosts and new producers to help that other station not rival this station, but to buttress it and to fortify it by that other station's alternative offerings. We're going to have, uh, say, for instance, spirituality being covered on that station while we tend to UFOs on this station, something of that nature. Each show will offer a different alternative for the listenership to uh, take advantage of when they feel like it. And um, we're starting off with at least one show right away. And more than likely, Carrie Lynn Cassidy will be joining us again on Project Camelot, which is uh, wonderful. I think that, that it's wonderful to bring back a uh, solid individual like that. I might bring Steve Travesty on to hold us through the break because I need someone who's very familiar. you got about a minute until break. Oh, yeah. There's no point then. I'll bring 917 on, and I'll have them hold through the break. 917, come on. I hope you don't mind holding through the break with us after you open up the discussion. Yeah, hi, Douglas. This is Pete Suzuki. I'm calling from uh, New York City. Hey, thanks so much. Very much appreciate it, Mr. Suzuki. I didn't catch your first name. Uh, Steve or, or, or what? No, it's Pete. 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 Thank you, yeah. Suzuki. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have we spoken on Facebook? Yeah, we have. I mean, actually, we did, but you deleted me because I asked you a question regarding Michael Aquino. I, I asked about you being considered an apologist. I didn't really accuse you of it, but I asked you about it, and you deleted me. <laughs> Um, but anyway, regardless, I'm, I'm a fan of your work. I definitely, uh, I listen to your show quite a bit. And because of your association with Aquino, um, I, I do have some questions. My, my main question was, um, regarding Mr. Ted Gunderson, because there's been some accusations that he was actually in league with, uh, Mr. Aquino. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that since you were so, you know, closely acquainted with, uh, Mr. Aquino. Thank you very much for asking. And uh, keep in mind that uh, I have several people who manage my Facebook. And okay. uh, that is 
Yeah, so my, what that could have been my secretarial assistant or it could have been my manageress. And they're both responsible for uh, doing their best to filter it. And there actually are other uh, managers who ask not to be named. So there's a number of people who work on my Facebook. Whenever you see my name on something, I'm answering, but I'm not responsible for deletions. Uh, that uh, I do have filters, though. But hang on, and I'll answer your question when we get back from the break. Thank okay. You for- Okay, hopefully everyone can still hear me, and uh, I'm online with uh, Pete Suzuki. Uh, Please be patient while I uh, review just for a moment here the fact that Revolution Radio is, of course, one of the fastest-growing mediums of uh, awareness dissemination, and that's only thanks to the support of uh, the listenership and uh, those that support us. Believe me, you are not only appreciated, you are loved, and you make it possible for us to continue. Somebody is really heavy breathing like Darth Vader. 917, you're Pete. breathing into the phone, out hard. <laughs> I think that's Pete, and I'll get, I'll get back to Pete in just a, just a moment here. But uh, what of, as always, my special thanks to Laura Lee Solomon, who has uh, almost single-handedly kept my manager as and myself certainly uh, afloat with uh, her aid to our program with Revolution Radio. And Revolution Radio is based on the volunteer, uh, shall we say, just the input of uh, saints like her. And uh, there's a name for such people in the film industry. They're called angels. And there's a reason for that. So uh, you are ever the angel in our book, uh, Laura Lee Solomon. And, of course, hello to Helen Davis, Trisha Lane Walwares, uh, the lovely Trina Foster, all of those other uh, young ladies that uh, Amanda Robb, etc., who have uh, um, Tatiana Verziala. I hope I pronounce her family name correctly, but Tatiana, believe me, uh, never forgotten. So uh, I do want to uh, thank you all and uh, remind you to call in as uh, Pete uh, Suzuki has done at 347-688-2902. Once again, that's 347-688-2902. And also 855-655-8453. That's our 800 number internationally. 855-655-8453, extension 802. Skype in through Freedom Screen. And remember, we're looking for new hosts, new producers. Uh, we are expanding. Uh, our popularity is such that we've accomplished a record in listenership. And we've already got Studio B, which you can find uh, on the uh, homepage. So, Mr. Suzuki, to uh, review his question, basically, Mr. Suzuki was asking about Ted Gunderson, and Ted Gunderson was very famous as a Federal Bureau of Investigations agent. He was a high-grade agent, meaning that he was what was known as a special agent. He was someone who was investigating some very high-profile cases that were just in the federal jurisdiction because they were heinous, they involved child molestation. He became known as an expert on satanic and occult crime, uh, the undercurrent of satanic crime that was sweeping the nation in the 1980s. And it was during that time that he appeared simultaneously to Colonel Michael Aquino on the Geraldo Rivera television program. Now, um, I was working with Michael Aquino, and I had never personally heard uh, Ted Gunderson's name brought up, and I was rather surprised when Leonard Horowitz and uh, Sherry Kane were very much uh, attacking the name of Ted Gunderson. Now, I had no stake in the matter, and I was very neutral on it. I could not remember or consciously recall having ever seen Ted Gunderson's name uh, show up on any correspondence. He didn't seem to be anywhere near. Now, this is what's so puzzling to me, is because I have been informed by multiple people who seem to have known Ted Gunderson very well that he was part of investigating the child daycare center scandal at the Presidio military base. Now, I had to deal with any number of FBI agents during the several years that it took them to never respond to my high school teacher, Gary Willard Hambright, amongst many other people raping the children at the child daycare center. 
ultimately, my high school teacher, Gary Willard Hambright, was arrested by the San Francisco Police Department, specifically by Sandy Gallant, was responsible for uh, his – one of the responsible agents for his arrest. Now, all of that was done because of evidence I brought that he was maintaining his collection of child pornography at the Vocational Institute where he, where he taught, where he taught me commercial illustration. Now, in terms of the FBI agents there, uh, Ted Gunderson was not one of them. So there's this reputation he has for investigating the Child Daycare Center uh, mass child assault scandal – um, that if he did so, had to be after the case. He might have been like doing what we would call investigative archaeology, which is kind of like he's going through cold cases. Now, if he were doing that, he obviously had no impact on anything uh, in that case. Now, I've heard other stories where he did really great work. Um, he, there was supposed to be a shipment of young boys from uh, various orphanages to the House of Saud, where they no doubt would have existed the rest of their lives in a harem. Uh, harems, in case most people don't know this, are filled far more with boys uh, than they are with females. And that is the horror of the situation. Harems are predominantly homosexual uh, flesh pits. And uh, in terms of the Gunderson story, he was supposed to have stopped this plane. He was supposed to have, like, tried to bring some Saudi uh, princes. Uh, by that, I mean prince in the plural, not a female princess. He was trying to bring some of these Saudi prince, uh, princely uh, young men to justice for being responsible for this shipment or attempting it and never could, of course, because they're part of the House of Saud, which essentially rules the U.S. So he had no jurisdiction. So uh, aside from that, he was uh, married for a very brief period of time to Magus Anton Zandor LaVey's ex-wife. So he was married to the black pope of the First Church of Satan's ex-wife for a short period of time. And uh, I had always assumed that this was something similar to a Patricia Hearst situation. Patricia Ann Hearst was abducted, of course, by the Symbionese Liberation Army uh, she was a young, very wealthy heiress who was indoctrinated through behavior modification to fight for them as a revolutionary. When she was finally arrested in San Francisco uh, by a San Francisco cop, she was so frightened she wet her pants. And he felt so bad for her that he basically uh, got a – because she'd been programmed to think that the pigs, the state police – the state, the servants of the state were going to kill her and torture her to death. She had been so programmed in that. That's why she urinated herself when she was arrested in fear. He felt so bad for her. He ultimately bonded with her and uh, I wound up marrying her. So I thought that the uh, – I had always assumed that the marriage between Anton Zandor LaVey's ex-wife and Ted Gunderson might have been something similar. Um, where maybe he was helping her to break away from her past and, and kind of reestablish a, a new life. But the thing that throws it all into the works for me, <laughs> when I was at the Conspiracy Con, where uh, Leonard Horowitz and Sherry Kane were attacking Anthony J. Hilder, who you can see a very bizarre interview that he conducted with me on the internet. Just look up uh, on YouTube, Anthony J. Hilder, Douglas Dietrich, and you'll uh, those two names together will bring that interview up for your morbid entertainment. Uh, mm -hmm. Very bizarre interview, but in terms of him, he loves Ted Gunderson. Many people do. They hold him in awe, in deep respect. They tend to forget uh, at one point Art Bell has his tricky moments and his, uh, his kind of unusual background as well. But they had accused Art Bell, meaning Ted Gunderson, of child molestation. And Art Bell sued Ted Gunderson and won what was a multi-million dollar settlement, which, of course, Ted Gunderson could never pay off. And yet somehow Art Bell was paid off, which – the only budget that could handle that would be a federal slush fund. The yeah. uh, And maybe Art Bell was never paid off, and maybe the settlement was just enough to uh, shut 
uh, Gunderson up or somehow punish him, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, my understanding was that it was, but Art Bell might educate us and tell us otherwise were he to be able to speak to this publicly uh, if he ever wanted to. But when the Franklin scandal went down and the investigation lasted for years, just like the Child Daycare Center investigation at the Presidio Military Base, Ted Gunderson was undoubtedly on the scene. And he had worked with the former CIA agent who was investigating the Franklin scandal and wrote a book about it. And I forget that CIA agent's name. He later on became a, uh important political figure. So you've got this complicated situation already where Ted Gooderson winds up apparently in a relationship that seems intimate with one of the mothers of the Franklin School scandal victims. And she told private detective, private investigator Ed Opperman, who's welcome to call in uh, if he would like, if he has the time. Uh, she told him that every morning Ted Gunderson would wake up and call and talk to Aquino on the phone. And right. that Colonel Michael Aquino was apparently yeah, giving him what could be the equivalent of orders. And uh, when she asked him why he was doing this, he said, oh, it gave him this feeling of power. I mean, it sounds to me like he, based on the way all of the information is converging, um, I'm not saying that Dr. Leonard Horowitz and Sherry Kane were correct. Their attack on Hilder and Gunderson was very um, – was very – acerbic <laughs> it it didn't seem and it didn't seem to be based on um a rational foundation they kept pointing out like they were on the tv show together geraldo rivera which is meaningless uh they uh kept pointing out that uh, meaning aquino and gunderson were on the geraldo rivera show together that of course would never by itself make them somehow collaborators but i can tell you right now i'm very puzzled at the situation i i tend to have the impression the, that uh, Ted Gunderson was running interference with any real investigations into any of these incidents. That it, I'd, I'd have to say that that would be my intuitive feeling, but it, it would be nothing more than that. Uh, based on everything that has been uh, gathered so far, I would have, just on the basis of his uh, apparent, uh, based on that one eyewitness, uh, continued um, telephonic uh, conversations with Colonel Aquino, um, it looks like there was a lot more to Gunderson than uh, than was in the light, and I mean that in the most literal and spiritual sense. <laughs> right, I believe that was no, I believe that was Noreen Gosh that you're talking about. It might be, it might be, yes. And, yeah. And, and, thank, and, and uh, the um, certainly Ed Opperman can confirm that for us. I, he, uh, unless of course there's some kind of client uh, privacy issue involved, he's usually very open about things that have already gone public. Uh, he can afford to be because once certain situations are public, there's really nothing to be hidden. So uh, yeah, my impression is that he he seemed to be a very mixed up, very uh, very questionable individual. He seemed to be going all over the place. And when Ed Opperman himself, I think. And Ed Opperman correct, can correct me on this if I miscommunicate it. My understanding is that Ed Opperman had actually met uh, Ted Gunderson uh, at least once, if not several times, and certainly communicated with him uh, telephonically during his own investigations and had been told by Mr. Gunderson that that Mr. Gunderson regretted not resisting uh, or fighting the uh, Art Bell lawsuit uh, more aggressively. And, uh, of course, one wonders, why would you accuse someone of child molestation without having dead certain evidence? I mean, when, when you make serious accusations like that against public figures, uh, especially if you're a retired uh, agent of the Bureau or uh, just um, a law enforcement agent, People like that never really retire. Um, I, I can only imagine someone doing a move like that under government orders. I mean, I, I, I think that anyone in the listenership would agree it, it does not speak bespeak of any common sense. It looks like the government pushed him onto it, and then when he got sued, the government paid it off. Because there's no way any single individual could absorb a lawsuit like that. The reverse speech dude, uh, Oates, I think his name is, the Australian guy who accused Art Bell of uh, child molestation, escaped justice uh, by just moving back to Australia. 
out of American jurisdiction, though he, of course, lost the lawsuit. He, of course, now is the pet of uh, Clyde Lewis, who brings him on to Ground Zero all the time. Uh, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see if he accuses Clyde Lewis of anything in the near future. <laughs> Right. And, but the the other the other critic of uh, Ted Gunnerson is uh, Barbara Hartwell, who he actually was working with when she first came out, and she was like you know doing lecture the lecture circuit with him in the first couple of years, and then she parted ways with him. Um, you you're aware of Barbara Hartwell, right? Uh, somewhat. Keep in mind, there's a lot of these people I'm not aware of. What what was what was that, Mr. Becker? I'm sorry. We got three other calls waiting. Oh, okay. Thank you for informing me. I had no idea. Mr. Suzuki, I'll have to let you go for now. Uh, you're welcome to call back anytime. I'll keep Mr. Travesty waiting because he listens while he waits and he knows the deal. Uh, as a fellow host, I do want him to plug the uh, audio of our last show. So take care, Mr. Suzuki. You're welcome to call back. And uh, please Thanks. bring on the next caller in the in the row, Mr. Becker. Thank uh, you. That would be 480. 480. Thank you so much for joining us on Saturday Night Firing Lines. And how are we tonight? Oh, <laughs> could be better, but I just wanted to share my gratitude once again with you for your devotion to getting the truth out. And um, I had a, a story to share with everybody today. Um, <clears throat> my brother was uh, taken in by the police. Um, he made a, a stupid move by being drunk and walking outside of his, his apartment being naked. And um, he... <laughs> Later on, he there was like six to nine cops that came to his door and charging him with um, nine felony counts of, of, I guess, I guess they wanted to pin him with pedophilia because there was nine kids in a bus that went by that saw him naked. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, but by the yeah. Way, you know, I, I, I apologize profoundly. I don't believe I caught your name. Are you willing to share your name, your first well, name at this least? Time, this time, not really because I want to... You know, keep my brother character, you know, in check because it's but, it's pretty but, it's pretty scary for him because you know he thinks when when they take him to jail he thinks okay well they're gonna be, they're gonna beat me up in jail if I get these nine felony counts for this insane you know injustice for taking him in for walking outside of his house you know naked for one and just happened to right. you know a bus you know school bus of kids saw you know saw him. So I think that's just a, a bunch of the corruption that's going on with the with the police force, obviously trying to get money for you know whatever they can. But you know, meantime, they're scaring you know the hell out of him um, by you know putting pinning that on him. And and if he went to jail, they'd want to beat him up. And if they if you know if he gets out for work, you know, then he's got that on his record. I mean, that's just blatant. Got too many people on. Call now. Ridiculousness, Oops, right? For a charge like that. Nine felony counts for, you know, walking outside of your house naked and having nine kids accidentally go by on the bus and and uh, see him. No, no, that's horrible. I mean, no, I'm appalled. I, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah, I understand completely where you're coming from. Uh, the uh, it, Here's the conundrum, and I uh, certainly am not suggesting this. It's I think your intuition holds true that you should not give us your name and you should not give us his name. I don't remember your name offhand. I know we've spoken before, and you have that lovely voice. And uh, the uh, I think I know who this is, but I'm not going to mention the name. But, uh, young lady, the uh, conundrum is is that uh, obviously the public cannot uh, provide any support or the listenership can't even provide moral support for your brother without knowing his name. But obviously I think it's probably better to keep it secret anyway and hope that it all blows over. Now, uh, most of these charges that are brought against people uh, hardly ever hold. I mean, we have to remember the vast majority of honest-to-God, genuine child predators are on the loose uh, for forever. <laughs> and uh, they uh, basically uh, flaunt it. Uh, there is uh, James Arthur Yanchik, uh, who basically is on Feet to Fire. He did this great uh, interview with me recently that I highly encourage everyone to watch on the uh, on, on uh, the uh, YouTube when he uploads it, which will be soon. Right now, they can get the MP3 by going to Feet to Fire with a numeric tube uh, to with a numeric two. Excuse me, Feet numeric two fire uh, to the website and look up the mp3 but he had in his neighborhood someone moved in 
And if you checked on the NCIC, the National Criminal uh, Inventory, and uh, if you checked on the CLETS, the Criminal Law Enforcement, you know, uh, lineup, basically he showed up as a child predator. This is a guy who moved into his neighborhood. And uh, so people found this out by just finding out who was new in the neighborhood and they were like, you know, checking on their internet and how did people respond? Well, they couldn't respond. They couldn't do anything because the man would, uh, he basically set up a, a telescope and he was looking at all the children in their backyards who were bathing in these little, uh, you know, uh, inflatable, uh, I, I, I think of them as inflatable rafts filled with water, but in little inflatable swimming pools and stuff. So people just had to start to move. And uh, during Halloween, the police, because they couldn't do anything about it, the police just had to bracket both ends of the – you would think they would put them in jail for the night. But no, they couldn't do that because he hadn't committed a crime uh, yet uh, again. So they had to bracket both ends of the block with police cars and have two cops, one on either end, just lounging around, waiting to see if he stepped outside to give children candy. And he did. And, of course, when the children went around to get candy, then the police were just eyeing him just to make sure he didn't do anything obscene. I mean, this is the insanity which we are left with. So, I mean, if that's happening to a genuine, honest to God, convicted, self-admitted child predator where he could just flaunt it, set up his telescope, give candy to kids. Okay, what is most likely going to happen to your brother is absolutely jack nothing. I, I really would be my intuition. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, a, was, um, that was mine. And actually, I have some good news about that for um, a solution. Why, too, for people if they come across this craziness which doesn't surprise me but um and he's just like the he's my favorite brother and i have six brothers and and you know he's just uh he would never do anything like that it was just a really stupid move and it was he was drunk so he didn't even know what he was doing but anyhow um he, um i told him to visualize himself getting out because of course he was scared to death and i had to talk him down and say look don't give him any power because they're using that to you know, still your life, basically. You know, they just want to use their little power trip. And yeah. so, um, but, you know, of course, he's really, 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 really concerned. And, but anyways, I told him to visualize himself getting out, and, and he said that he actually did that, and he was brought to tears when he told me that that's what he used, because people just don't really understand the power that they have with that, you know. And he said he got out, and... um you know, as he was waiting in line, when all these people before him, they were just not giving him the time of day. They were handing them all papers. He thought he was done. He was like the last one. He thought, well, you know, I'm screwed, you know. But um, he did that visualization, and it worked. And I knew that intuitively that he has that innately inside him. He just doesn't understand that power yet. And so luckily he listened to that, and I, I want to serve them, you know, everybody involved, these OPP you know courtesy notices you've heard of that with the with that movement for serving um, I'm not real good at explaining all that stuff but I am serving a bunch of papers to all the people uh, involved yeah thank you and believe me I you know so long as you got that out there it's it's kind of like you know this is part of law enforcement law enforcement whether they like it or not they're going to be celebrities so you know what you're doing is not wrong and there's nothing wrong with uh, bringing that up so thank you love you dearly you take care we're going to bring the other people on now uh, who's next uh, Mr. Becker uh, Chris Chris Wallace was next hey guys okay hey, okay guys. and uh, thank you sir and uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, glad to have you with us again, and uh, hope all's going well with you. It is, it is. Um, I just wanted to, uh, if we could, uh, shoot some altercation about the whole um, Gunderson thing. I'll add to it what I know. And um, he, from his own mm -hmm. mouth, was um, working with, um, you know, subverting the Black Panthers. And, um, you know, he was working mm -hmm. in Cohen Pro. Uh, back when he was FBI, and then later on he was picked up by the CIA, and the CIA were right about, um, there's a little bit of feedback there. there you were right about him with the CIA, but anyway, yeah, yeah. and, and um, Anton LeVay's wife. Um, also, what happened was, was uh, I believe the capacity that he was working in was that um, he would kind of um, 
you know, get the people that were coming out, uh, like Paul Bonacci uh, in the Franklin cover-up. It was uh, John Kemp that wrote that book. And then there were some aspersions. Yes, thank you, sir. That's, yeah. that's, that's right. right. And it was uh, Noreen Gosh and her son, she wrote the uh, the book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home. And a lot of people think that um, uh, uh, the boy, Johnny Gosh, actually became Jeff Gannon. And he said, came forward and... Yeah, but uh, go on, Mr. Wallace. Yeah, no, uh, it, but but Ed Gain, you're not talking about that. It's it's possible that Johnny Gosh became Ed Gain, the uh, the no, basis no, no, for no, the no, 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 not Ed Gain. No, no, no. Um, he became the White House reporter, uh, Jeff Gannon. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, for whatever reason, um, I I uh, always try to implore you to shout because you know you have a very low. Oh, I know, voice. I know. I sorry. Yeah, I'll talk louder. Um, what happened was was that um, he he came on actually uh, because it was actually he was asking softball questions to um, you know as a White House uh, press secretary and they were like who is this guy and what are his credentials and where did he come from and if you ever heard him speak um, when he wasn't asking these these questions uh, he was a very kind of scrambled individual and you know it seemed like you know there was. He kind of popped up and then disappeared. And there's pictures of George Bush, George W. Bush, kissing him on the forehead. And I actually know the Bushes. I don't want to get into that right now. I got to watch what I say sometimes. But um, they, they, right. The, the thing is, is <laughs> this, that's for a different show. The, th- the thing is, is that um, it was a very uh, crazy story with a lot of twists and turns, and it uh, went through the uh, Reagan. Uh, administration and Lawrence King and uh, Boys Town, and who uh, Charles Manson was actually uh, uh, there. Um, it ties into the whole super soldier thing, and uh, it was it's very interesting. There was a, a few other things that I was going to bring up tonight, but I know you have other calls that are maybe a little bit beyond the scope of this. And um, no, I, I do, appreciate that. Okay. So, so what I'd like. Right. What I'd like you to do, Mr. Wallace, you know you're always welcome back here. Just call in earlier next Saturday and we'll get those things out of the way. Is there anything particularly topical you'd like to leave us with? Because I'd like to back up some of what you're saying about the presidents and, and some of these celebrity sex scandals, you know, while we're bringing in the other callers. But, uh, you know, is there anything else you want to leave with us before I let you go? The one thing I would, I would implore everybody to definitely check out the um, uh, John DeCamp uh, and his Franklin cover-up. Uh, there's a full movie on that. I would tell everybody to check out Noreen Gosh and Why Johnny Can't Come Home. Uh, look for the um, the interview that uh, Bill Maher does with um, uh, Jeff Gannon on YouTube, and it'll actually bring tears to your eyes if you know what the guy's really been through, because they're all laughing at him. And, um, you know, he became a gay uh, 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 escort. And, um, you know, it was just they were they were kind of mocking him through the whole thing. And uh, my wife is actually calling me in the background. I have a few other things. Maybe I'll Skype them in or write them in the chat room, and um, yeah. I'll, I'll go from there. But that's that, those are the names. And people actually cast aspersions on DeCamp and said that he was a part of the whole thing. So it's a big you know, mess of what's going on. I, I'll do some oh, research on it. No, definitely. And I'll, yeah. and I'll, throw, it's all very I'll calm. post more at it when I can. But um, good show good. to yeah, thank you. Okay, and always good. welcome to have you. Believe me. Okay, and uh, who's next, uh, Mr. Becker? Well, Steve's still sitting there, but uh, Heather's joined us. Yeah. Oh well, obviously I'll take Heather Holman before uh, Steve Travesty. I mean, uh, you still have one other call besides that. It's Ed Opperman, I think is his name. Oh, Ed Opperman. Yes. Was so he the detective that the other gentleman was? Yeah, he's sitting in the winds waiting on you. Okay, we'll bring on Ed Opperman. Heather, please be patient. You know, as a co-hostess, I'm sure you understand. Uh, So, Mr. Opperman, thank you very much for joining us, good sir. I hope I've uh, appropriately communicated or understood some of what I was relating in stories uh, that you and I were sharing with each other based on our experiences. Hey, Doug, how are you? Um, Yeah, we have most of it correct. Um, uh, A couple of things. Now, because you remember also, too, that I, I was involved in negotiating the settlement with Art Bell and at that lawsuit with uh, David John Oates and Robert Stevens. So now, after that was settled, uh, see, Gunderson had insurance. He had errors and omissions insurance, which is insurance that every PI will carry that if you're in an investigation, you make a mistake and you get sued, your insurance company is going to cover it for you. 
So he wasn't worried. He wasn't concerned about the lawsuit. I, I tried oh. to contact him. He didn't care. He didn't care. And then after his insurance company, because also, too, when you're in a lawsuit and your insurance company is covering it, they, they assign a very uh, inexperienced type lawyer uh, on your behalf. And uh, it, it's not a, a really uh, elaborate kind of trial. Uh, so anyway, he had to, he lost that uh, or he settled that lawsuit because his insurance company paid off. And then he came out later on and said, hey, if I had known uh, I was going to, you know, come off looking bad, I would have fought this. Are you there, mm. Douglas? <laughs> okay. So that, in all fairness, that – yeah. Yeah. Can can you hear me, uh, yeah, any of I, you? <laughs> yeah, I hear you fine. Yeah, that was just okay. a pretty good – uh, time period there. <laughs> a good pause. A good pause for the oh, call. Yeah, yeah. He's he's uh, he's uh, so used to hearing me talk nonstop that whenever I stop talking, he thinks I died. That's a. <laughs> but um, no, Opperman. No, thank you very much for correcting that. By the way, uh, how did the uh, basketball game go? Well, we lost, but my daughter did great. <laughs> she was the second highest scorer. But we, we lost again, I tell you. But we had good coaching this time and uh, good players. We got a great team, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still rooting for them. So we, there's always next week, right? Of course. That's right. That's right. No, that that's wonderful. And uh, it, no, I really appreciate your your bringing that up about uh, the um, and Mr. Gunderson. In all fairness, these things always need to be ironed out. Uh, he still strikes me as a, a very uh, confused, for lack of a better word. He seemed to be very conflicted or confused. What was your impression when you spoke to him about his uh, mentation processes? Did he seem to have it all together, or uh, that's, or, that's how did question. he strike? Good question. I always liked him. Okay, and uh, he was always a lot older than me, a lot more experienced, and a lot more uh, well known. Uh, when I was dealing with Ted, I was like a little guy, and he was a big shot. Okay, so I had to treat him with a certain kind of deference and respect, of course, right? Uh, so I, I, you know, that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, but there was always this confusion in our in our conversations that he thought he always wanted me to um, uh, make duplicate copies of these tape recordings for him and these videotapes and help him sell these videotapes that he was selling. And I have nothing to do with that kind of business whatsoever. And I don't know what gave him the thought that I would be interested in doing that for him. But every time I talked to him, I was like, hey, you know, when are we going to do that with the tapes? You know, <laughs> it just never came about. So uh, my one experience with him as far as being confused would be that situation. Yeah. But I, I did speak to one of the mothers in the uh, McMartin, uh, the mother, uh, one of the victims in the McMartin case. And she told me, and to my shock, because at the time I really loved and respected Ted Gunderson, and I held him in high regard, and she told me that uh, he talked to Aquino every day. It's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. And and yet, for some reason, it's, it resonates. For some reason, it resonates. And uh, definitely, I. Uh, by the way, your audio is coming through very bubbly. It kind of sounds like you're talking to us, or it sounds to me like you're talking uh, while you're kind of like underwater and the bubbles okay. are coming out. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that everyone knows that Ed Opperman, as far as I'm concerned, is one of our primary stars. Uh, I would prefer Tila to keep his company over his any day, but that's beside the point. So, uh, but he's one of our primary stars at the Super Soldier Summit. He is certainly going to be there to honor us with his presence, and uh, you'll be able to, if you come, uh, shake hands with him and ask him about the dirt on all the stars and celebrities that he's been working with, which has been uh, quite a number. And as a private investigator, he's seen more uh, than uh, the overwhelming majority of, of us ever want to see. By the way, what is your opinion on the television series Cheaters? What do you think of those people? What? Well, that's a long story, okay? And uh, they're actually doing a, a Celebrity Cheaters. Uh, is going to come out a new series that's coming out right now. And uh, Michael Lohan is going to be the host, and they were bouncing my name around as being the investigator who was going to, uh, you know, be the investigator face uh, for that new series. Uh, but I, you know, I haven't, I don't have a deal yet. Okay, yeah. but I'm still holding out. I'm hoping. Oh, by the way, the other guy they're talking about doing that deal is uh, is Bo Deedle, uh, and Bo Deedle Investigations, a, a really a high profile investigator from New York. I've known him for years and years, um, and he hosted a show on Fox News. One time, he had one show where he interviewed uh, Jeff Gannon, who this other young man, uh, this other caller thought was Johnny Gosh. And I can tell you, I don't, I don't think Johnny Gosh and Jeff Gannon are the same person because right. their, their, data, yeah, their date of births don't match up. There's a, there's a discrepancy in the ages. 
But Bo Deedle held this guy to the fire and interrogated this guy okay. uh, on TV. And I'll tell you something else. I'm, I'm making my audio is well bad, so I'll get off fast. But Bo Deedle is very uh, politically connected with the Bushes and with the Reagans. Uh, he was actually uh, the uh, campaign finance director for Connecticut. So I'm sure he was put in there for that one show uh, to do some damage control. Wow, that is impressive. I very much appreciate your sharing that. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, it turns out, before I let you go, um, are you hearing me okay, by the way, Mr. Opperman? Yeah, 100%. I hear you great. That's great, yeah, and and I also think that for whatever reason, there's also a delay that shouldn't be there, not from you, but from Chris Wallace. I noticed from the majority of my callers tonight, with you, it's not a delay, it's just that bubble sound, but it's all part of the phenomenon tonight. But the uh, thing that I was going to point out was that, uh, I'll, I'll point it out later during the show, I better let you go now, bring on uh, the other callers, and then get to it if I have a chance, but it reminded me so much of the uh, Jesse Ventura situation with David Ike, and it turns out that uh, one of the uh, people who has apparently a great deal of uh, uh, sway in uh, that uh, program of Conspiracy Theory, uh, I don't know what her position is exactly, but uh, it was David Icke's ex-wife <laughs> that oh, was, somehow, okay. was somehow had some influence on, on that program. So uh, she was in some kind of administrative position with the powers that be that produced conspiracy theory, and so that it was uh, therefore not a surprise that he ambushed uh, David Icke the way he did. Uh, you know, but I'm, I'm I'm very divorced from the entire uh, David Icke paradigm. I, I actually am somewhat surprised he holds this way he does with so many people. Uh, but uh, at any rate, before we let you go, just out of curiosity, any dirt you have on the David Icke situation? Uh, I, I I take it that you haven't run into across him in any investigation proceedings. No, nothing on David Icke. Nothing off the top of my head, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much, sir. You're the best. Mr. Opperman is uh, always welcome here and glad you were able to get through. Many thanks for your friend to, for helping you come on through uh, That tonight. was Jer Bear. Jer Bear. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You'll have to pronounce that once Jer again because I could Jer Bear. Jer Bear. Okay, <laughs> right. Thank you, Jer Bear. You're very Thanks welcome. The best. I remember Jer God bless you all. God bless you. Yes. Good night. Bless you. Thank you. Good night to you as well. And uh, so, uh, is the how many more we have? Uh, Heather Holman and Steve Travesty or anyone else, Mr. That, Baker? That's it. Thank God. Okay, for, <laughs> for right now. <laughs> so, uh, Lady Holman, I will take you first. And uh, what's on your mind tonight, dear girl? I'll just be brief. Um, I was calling in hoping that the caller, the 480 caller, was still listening. I was going to um, suggest um, an ideal defense attorney for her brother, um, and he'll probably work with them as far as you know costs and things like that. His name is Phil Noland, and I'll drop his um, link in chat. And I'm not sure if 480 is in chat. I know she's not on the line or in the air with us right now anymore. Oh, well, if you... You know, normally I would ask you to write it in the text box, and I would just read it out loud to her. Okay. But why don't you vocalize it? Do, okay. do you, you don't have the number with you, do you? Yes, I do. I have it right here. Um, his name is Phil Noland, N-O-L-A-M-D, and um, he has a phone number. He could be reached at 602-252-1099, and he's one of the best um, defense attorneys in Arizona, and so I wish them the best of luck, and that's all I really have to say. Uh, you know, you're so darling, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, that individual ought to be giving you a commission, dear lady. So um, uh, that's uh, well, so, it's, uh, he's just a, a good guy. You know, I'm not trying to promote him or anything. I'm just trying to help out the caller. <laughs> Oh, understood, and it's appreciated. I mean, uh, believe me, a lot of these things happen, and that's that. that I I can't imagine anything more frightening than that. If you truly um, did something like that in a moment of drunken, blind stupidity, uh, then uh, and and you get whacked like that, which is something that could uh, you know impact you quite seriously, conceivably. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that's, that's, they make a big deal out of that in Arizona. I don't know about him getting off. Um, easily but there was all a similar incident that had happened just the day before with a gentleman 
who um, they're not they didn't even arrest because they think he's insane. So that could help them, too. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's a that's a good good point. I mean, it never hurts to uh, to play crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, Douglas. Well, thank you. I know Trav has been waiting, so I'm gonna let you go. Oh, you're too kind. Anyhow, love you dearly. Mwah. You okay, take care. Thank we'll you. Speak uh, soon. Bye. Bye bye. And uh, okay, now we're down to the travesty. Thank you for your infinite patience, sir. You are the man. And how is the uh, audio uh, uh, coming along? Have we got the records for that uploaded anywhere where you could send me a link that I could? Post yeah, on the my show. Uh, yeah, it's there. It's on YouTube. Uh, Hawked it added to, to YouTube. I'll, I'll go find you the link. Um, uh, I guess while we're chatting uh, here. Um, Oh, what, it, just remember, good sir, I'm too tech tarded to ask this, and obviously my, my screen is actually down. I'm talking to a black screen, so what you need to do is email it to me when you get the chance. Oh, just, the email's you know, good, yep. Yeah. yeah. What? I said the email's good, yeah, I'll send you an email. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. By the way, my audio is just terrible. Uh, everybody is coming through to me like, um, voices from the other side on the Ouija board. It's, it's just torture. But uh, So tell us uh, what brings you on air tonight, Mr. Travesty. Certainly, uh, Mr. Travesty, of course, is host for Project Red Beam, just as uh, our uh, dear lady Holman is co-hostess with uh, Rectify on uh, Tuesday night's uh, open uh, roundtables that I invite everyone to call into. Uh, and, of course, uh, we have Solaris Blue Raven, who is following us who is, of course, an authoress and uh, a, a wonderful person who explains many things from in the theme of her radio show, Awaken Perspective. So, and, of course, we have Mr. Steve Travesty, who uh, I was – I actually said something on Steve Travesty's show that I've never been able to get across on any other program, which was I was talking about the reason for – much of the government research into zombism by, besides simple slave labor or exploitation. So I was able to express that on his program for the first time in my interview history. So I do invite people to listen to that and to what? listen to his program in general. So What, what else was the date of that sir? broadcast? Yes, if you could provide us with that, good sir. Steve? Uh, Steve? Well, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't know you were asking me. What was it? Um, yeah, I want to the show you just had with Douglas because I'll I'll go ahead and stick it on on B when this. Oh show yeah, is over. sure, Ab- absolutely. It, but I have to have the date. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was this Thursday. It was uh, it was the 25th, the April 25th episode. Thank you, Mr. Becker. You're the best. Yeah, you know, without my producer, uh, Mr. Becker, I wouldn't be able to do anything. And uh, he will be replaced on Tuesday nights by the lovely Kat Jenkins, uh, simply because I got sick of looking at his icon uh, because of all that long hair and the bong sticking out of his mouth. I, I always find it rather obscene. but uh, So I'll be seeing that only once a week from now on, on Saturdays, when I can handle it. Uh, but uh, he, at any Less rate, he nightmares. will nightmares. Yes, that's right. He will be producing and essentially running Studio B. So uh, if uh, Studio B uh, starts uh, putting on a lot of Jimi Hendrix music and you see lava lamps as the icon for you know a lot of their shows, uh, you know who to blame. So aside from that, returning back to Mr. Travesty, uh, I keep thinking of him as The Walking Dead because of the series that I keep conflating him with. Uh, who's your favorite character on that series, by the way, Steve? Oh, man. Man. Oh, God. I don't even know. I, <laughs> I, I, guess, like, I guess it's a tie between uh, Daryl and Michonne. Daryl, yeah, uh, Daryl's the crossbow uh, 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 badass who oh, was uh, one of the main characters in the Boondock Saints movie, and then Michonne is the uh, is the, the the black woman who's the samurai. Oh, cool! I, I like that. That's uh, because I, I read the original comics, at least the first several uh, issues of them, and uh, the, the there was the cop and the Asian kid. They all the cop was supposed to be the main running character whose children were growing up in that. In that world, uh, did they die off, or uh, you, um, you know? he's got one child in in the TV series? His his son, I think his name's Carl, if yes, I recall right. correctly. And uh, yeah. you know, so he's still there. He's he still has survived. Um, his his wife passed away, 
but she passed away because they were forced to do a brutal C-section uh, and saved her child that she was carrying. So now they've got a baby uh, in the crew. Oh, right. Oh, that's so, that's so, um, yeah. But, well, at least it wasn't born a zombie baby like in that uh, Day of the Dead film. But, okay, without dwelling on that, the, all of those morbidities, sir, um, uh, aside from helping us to plug the great interview that we did and to bring the the attention that your show, uh, your program, the uh, Project Red Beam, deserves, how did, uh, what, what else was on your mind for tonight? Because I did want to just make a few last announcements before yeah. we go off there. Uh, I so had what, a, what else brought uh, you on tonight, sir? Well, the thing that brought me on tonight is you were talking about uh, the rise of the uh, of, of paganism in the absence of the atheistic yeah. culture of Europe, and that piqued me because you mentioned the Norse gods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, you know, for people that know me, I love um, uh, 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 heavy metal music, and ninety percent of the the metal music I'm listening to is uh, is is basically folk metal from Europe that and 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 most of it is effectively these guys are you know worshiping Odin and Thor and Freya and all them and they very much uh they make music that brings those gods uh back to life with the rich culture and and history and uh you know having a flair of the badass going along with it because we're talking about stuff that's like that's very death metal power metal in in style so my question uh, uh, was because uh, I was I was hearing how you were putting it, especially because the National Socialists had something to do with the resurrecting of these gods in a very literal spiritual sense. Um, uh, I just want to know, like, how much of it is 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 all bad? Because of course I am subjecting myself to the pop culture of this music uh, that that comes through in the European metal scene. And, Over. of course, we've been joined by Hijacker, too, by the way. Oh, no, thank you very much for asking. Uh, I think it's important. Oh, great, great. And I'll, I'll bring him on uh, in just a, a few moments. I do want to say, Mr. Travesty, you have uh, nothing to worry about. Uh, the National Socialist in, uh, aspect of uh, bringing back the uh, pagan gods, uh, the, it's, it's like a technology. Uh, rocketry technology sourcing from someplace is a neutral uh, technology. Uh, so the, uh, the gods are the gods. They were there uh, for millennia, for an eternity before the National Socialist in, who acted as a trigger mechanism to help them uh, re-enter uh, the paradigmatic matrix once again. Uh, so uh, believe me, it's, a, uh, it's attached and it's not. So definitely uh, I, I, I think that you can uh, keep peace with that. And uh, I'll go much more into depth of that when uh, – what you need to do is when you need to plug me with a question like that, call in right at the beginning of the show, and that theme would dominate the show. <laughs> so I might even speak to that on uh, Topical Tuesday like next Tuesday for the entire show. You but so far, uh, is that okay with you before I let you go? Yeah, that's great. And I sure, I, I'm sure you can't get it, Douglas, but I just threw a link in the chat real quick. Um, that's a picture, uh, an air shot of Wacken Open Air Festival in Germany. Uh, that's a 2012 shot. And what you're looking at is basically a, an, an annual event, which is like Woodstock for heavy metal in Europe. And it's bigger than Woodstock consistently every single year. That's how big that is amongst young people in the alternative culture in Europe. And it brings people from all over the world to enjoy some of the biggest bands in the pagan metal scene. And with that, I will bid yeah, you adieu. I think that that's it, – it's – yeah, and I want you to know, Mr. Travesty, it's like Valja Holduns. It is a new religion on the scene. And it's going to be one of the major belligerents, uh, along with voodoo, on the new in the new dark age of religious warfare. And uh, it's a vital, vibrant uh, religion and spiritual path all its own. And there are always uh, darker demonic elements to any religion, whether it's Christianity, uh, Valjaholduns, or voodoo, or of course paganism. That's just part of the nature of religions. So, but in general, religions are religions, and they are spiritual paths. So, uh, okay. So, I hope that makes sense. Hope that's coherent. You got about two minutes. 
I yeah, got one minute okay, probably. So yeah, thank you for yeah, calling. Yeah, I just wanted to bring your attention to the uh, – I, I put a link in the chat room, freedomslips.com, uh, real time, real world, uh, when the bomb went off, real bomber. They finally got the video. Somebody was filming in a window right above the explosion, no bodies, nobody got killed, no, no legs blown off, all one big fake. You can see it for yourself. Just go to freedomslips.com. That's all. Case closed. I very much, yeah, I, I very much appreciate your bringing that up. I do want everyone to review that. I'm not quite not quite sure about the young blonde jogger. My understanding is there 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 was a a death, and she may have been killed, if not by the bomb, she might have been killed by. When you're in crowds like that, somebody can shoot you or stab you from the back and kill you. And uh, you know, on a bomb scene like that. How is anyone going to tell whether it's from shrapnel or from somebody stabbing you in the back? But my understanding is that someone died. I might be miscommunicating. Uh, but anyhow, Hijacker, thank you. You're the best. And uh, listen to Hijacker on Tuesday nights. He's uh, great. All of you are great. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, have yourselves a wonderful weekend. We'll be here Tuesday night. And um, take care till then. <laughs>